it is nice to be back. And I was uh, looking out here, I thinking people misread the flyer and thought that Francis actually was. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you disappointed? Um, I am honored to be here tonight and to have been asked to be part of the Crossroads series. As Peter said, when we were over at 22, uh, 22 Northwest Hoyt and we moved over here, we decided we had to inaugurate this, this locale, this former uh, the place that used to be our retreat house. And we decided to start it with the Crossroads series. It was meant to bring together thought and faith, art and prayer, uh, Jesuit spirituality and Ignatian ambition where lay and Jesuit partners might meet together in conversation and discernment for the building of the church and the building of bridges out to culture. Through the work of many people, and I, uh, I must say I especially recall tonight uh, the late Marilyn Curvin, who uh, really, I had the idea, I always had bright ideas, and I needed really great people to implement them. And uh, it was Marilyn who really made that first series work, and for many years ran it, and her picture, that's not her picture of her, it was a picture owned by her, uh, on the wall there reminds me of her presence here always. So a lot of water has gone under those bridges, and the culture has changed quite a, quite a bit since the original crossroads. And yet, uh, I feel a little daunted tonight. But the truth is, I don't see myself as a scholar or as an expert in anything. I have no special training in the papacy or in ecclesiology, in Pope Francis, or even in sociology of religion. And though I will not be quite so disingenuous as I sometimes am to say I am nothing but a simple pastor, um, I must in all honesty preface my comments by saying that I am a practitioner in the church and I am not a scholar of it. My knowledge, such as it is, comes from experience and observation, and from a well-schooled but amateur reading of texts and contexts. In other words, I come here to the crossroads as a pilgrim, like I think everyone in this room. I come not as a guide. So tonight, my hope is that we might travel together for a while. I'm going to give you some observations, some experiences, some thoughts, and then I hope that the main part of our evening will be question and answer, and give and take, and observations, and you can tell me where I'm wrong. You can be just like my parishioners in that. Uh, and it'll be a chance for us really to experience a little bit of what the church is meant to be. What I hope to explore tonight is something about the promise of the church today in the era of Pope Francis was calling me right now. <laughs> and in a time of unique challenge and opportunity, I believe honestly that we are at an amazingly significant moment in the history of the church, a time in which there is immense blessing and brokenness, when we are strongly tempted, and with good reason at times, to abandon the church, to go it alone, and when we are also very much needed by the church and have to unite with it in a way we have never before conceived. This week, uh, this last week, you may have heard that uh, the Diocese of Helena declared bankruptcy, another diocese. Mm -hmm. The headlines continue to go on. We in the Northwest, uh, who know a little bit about these uh, events, know that the church continues to be broken, continues to hurt, and yet we are part of it, and uh, asked to be a deeper part of it under Francis. I believe that this moment with Francis's papacy is a call to communion, to conversation, and to community, as the title of this talk indicates. It's crucial for the future of the church, and maybe for the future of the planet. Francis is not the Messiah in all this. I don't think uh, we do well anymore to put so much power for our spiritual life in the hands of any one person either one we like or one we dislike. I think at times if we dislike someone, we can give them so much power they can drive us from the church. We don't want to simply reverse that with someone we do like. We are called now by this election of a new pope to a conversation that calls us to become the church, <coughs> to become
coming in a new way. So, with all that as introduction, let me begin. I want to talk first about that. I was afraid Peter was going to steal all my thunder because one of the first things I want to talk about is the title itself, Thinking as the Church, as opposed to Thinking with the Church. When Ignatius came to compose the part of the spiritual exercises known as the Rules for Thinking with the Church, he did not see this perfect city of God of Augustine, but a messy, troubled, sexually perverse, morally bankrupt institution hanging on for dear life against the growing power of the Reformation and the corruption within its own ranks. Hardly naive or innocent, Ignatius had been thrown out of the Holy Land, though he had personally discerned a call to stay. He had been imprisoned several times by the Inquisition and ordered to stop offering the spiritual exercises until he went back to school, even though he felt his firsthand knowledge of spiritual matters was su sufficient. Even in Rome, as he and his companions professed their special vow of obedience to the Vicar of Christ, he was deeply aware how many priests were illiterate and lax in their practice of the faith. He was aware that even the Pope to whom he made this offer, Paul III, had fathered children out of wedlock, making two of them cardinals, by the way, <laughs> and he ruled the Vatican that was known for its corruption and greed. Yet, in the midst of all of this, all that he knew, all that he saw, Ignatius writes these words, quote, We must put aside all judgment of our own and keep the mind ever ready and prompt to obey in all things the true spouse of Christ our Lord, our Holy Mother, the hierarchical church. Seems pretty ridiculous, honestly. <laughs> If the church is filled with corruption and sin, why should we seek this sentire cum ecclesiae, this thinking with the church? Why suspend our own judgment when those who hold authority have no sign of wisdom or compassion? Yet for Ignatius, the goal of the exercises, to find God in all things and all things in God, required that we think with the church, required being part of this church. The Latin word sentire is, or is not easily translated, but it means more than logical or analytic thinking. It means being with, heart and soul, mind, body, and spirit. Sentire cum ecclesiae for Ignatius is more than a descent to an idea or to a series of propositions, as I think thinking with the church has often, even in our own age, been reduced to. For him, it is thinking, loving, being with the church. The body of Christ in the world. Thinking with the church is about growing into a relationship by which I can open myself in love even to this hierarchical church. Not because I have suspended my thinking, but because I have opened my heart to the love and to the spirit that rests in the midst of the church. Ignatius never denies the wounds of the church, but calls us to love the church in its woundedness, just as we would love the wounded Christ. And in this, Francis, I think, is a true son of Ignatius. For Ignatius and Francis both believe that the love of the incarnate Christ encountered in the spiritual exercises requires the love of an incarnate church, a real church, not some vague spiritual force, some sort of, we all feel we're kind of on this together, but a true church, wounded, damaged, human, and <coughs> Just last week, uh, Francis, Francis is doing these, all these wonderful things. I feel like he's stealing my material. <laughs> Just when I'm starting to write this, all of a sudden it comes on, the, on uh, the internet, one of his daily homilies, he's talking about the church, and he says you cannot uh, say that you love Christ and not really love the church, not be in the church. Because to be in the church is to love Christ in the world, in one another. It's through the church that we come to love the incarnate Christ as a lived reality. So Francis and Ignatius, Ignatius seems to be a, 
Now, Francis seems to be a true son of Ignatius, I think, in so many ways, but in this especially. But the church he loves, and the church he calls us to love, is a very different church than the church of Ignatius. Different not only in its structures, but really different, I think, because of the effects of some of the things of the, the generations that have followed. Francis is, like all of us, shaped by the Church of the Second Vatican Council and by all that follows from that moment in history. This council, which is still a source of struggle and debate, as I'm going to talk about in a minute, changes our understanding of the church and thus in a very real way calls us not merely to think with the church, but to think as the church. In other words, we, whether we're ordained or lay, religious or secular, must come to understand that the church is not a counterpoint for us. The church is us. That is, all the baptized members of the people of God. And this is where Vatican II makes this huge change. This is where Vatican II transforms our notion of the church. Prior to Vatican II, the most often used image of the church is that of sort of a perfect society. It comes in Augustine's City of God, Later, it will be written of in Bellarmine's, uh, Bellarmine's great work on the church. All the images of the church are always this perfect society. And in that perfect society, who do you speak of first? Well, like most history, you speak of people in charge first, the clergy. And under the, cler <laughs> and under the clergy, there are, of course, the religious who have their own structures and their own. And then down there doing the work, there's the laity. Those people who we work to save and all that, but who are sort of the third part. Vatican II does something radically different. It maintains the idea that there is there are these different stages, different uh, modes of the church. But it also puts over this overarching idea of the people of God. The hierarchical arrangement is therefore just that. It is an arrangement of the people of God. But it is the whole people of God, consecrated by the Spirit and redeemed by Christ, who are the church. The church is not in its fullness the clergy, and then at the second level, the religious, and then finally sort of dragging up the rear and maybe occasionally saved the laity. No, the church is the whole people of God, arranged in particular ways in a hierarchical structure for the salvation and the praise of God salvation of people and the praise of God. But it is the people of God who is the universal, who is the overarching. So it is that, in, and there's a passage that I think particularly shows this, qualities such as infallibility, which in earlier days had been spoken of when we still hear it all the time, well, the Pope is infallible in matters of faith and morals. No, the Pope, as an individual, is not infallible in matters of faith and morals. Dear Archbishop, no. <laughs> the, Pope, the Pope is infallible in matters of faith and moral because the body of the church is infallible in matters of faith and morals. And so it says in, in the pastoral constitution, or in the, excuse me, in the dogmatic constitution of the church, it says, the body of the faithful as a whole, anointed as they are by the Holy Spirit, <coughs> cannot err in matters of belief thanks to a supernatural sense of the faith which characterizes the people as a whole, it manifests this inerring, unerring quality when from the bishops down to the last member of the laity, it shows universal agreement in matters of faith and morals. The reason this passage jumps out at me is last week I was in a, if you, ever, if you happen to be a friend of me on Facebook, I was in a particularly vigorous conversation on Facebook about um, something I had written. And this person, and I said, well, you know, what if we learn in science that things are different? Wouldn't that change our moral position on, on, on an issue? So what if the issue in particular was one of uh, homosexuality? And I said, what if we learn that homosexuality isn't a disease, but is in fact natural and has been natural throughout all of history? Would that not change the moral position that we would take? And this person wrote back to me and says, the magisterium has spoken, <laughs> and we must follow the magisterium. And you read this, and you realize, no. The magisterium is in the heart of the people, in the life of the people. And the 
the, the papal magisterium is only infallible in its teaching when it speaks on behalf of the whole church. Now, I'm not preaching sort of a socialist ideal of the church in a, or a, it's not a, Vatican II does not set up a democratic model for the church, but it does say this. It does say you don't act as an individual when you're the pope and you declare something infallibly. You act, you speak always, you must speak after discerning with the whole of the people. It raises amazing, this passage itself raises amazing questions just given the recent document on the Synod where the, the Pope writes out to the people and asks, and he, or writes to the bishops and says, I want you to go among the people of God and find some feedback. By the way, only 40 <laughs> bishops in the United States sought any input mm. from the laity. Only 40 bishops in the United States. And there are more than 150 bishops in the United States. There's hundreds of bishops in the United States. Only 40 bishops sought any input at all. And in saying that, what he, and, he, and one of the issues that he brought forward was the issue of contraception, the humani vitae. Is this, and one of the questions was, is this a, a teaching that has been received, <laughs> accepted by the faithful? That question has huge amounts of meaning given this, given this passage. And the fact that the Pope would ask it, even of the bishops, let alone whether the bishops would ask it of anyone else, is a dramatic um, eye-opener for what this Pope is saying and where this Pope is, is moving. Moving on. Again, such acknowledgment of the people of God doesn't transform the church into a democracy. The hierarchical arrangement is affirmed in Vatican II. But it is a significant movement. And in contrast to many of those who claim the pope or bishop have in themselves this power to dictate, this is saying that people, the, the members of the church, the, high, the clerics in the church, the religious in the church, those in power in the church, act uh, in persona ecclesiae, the term that's sometimes used, in the, in the person of the church. They act on behalf of and through the power and by the grace that moves in the people of God, not in them alone. So in, in Vatican II, the church has various metaphors, often organic metaphors, the mystical body, our mother, the sheepfold. The most significant of them is the people of God. Other older metaphors are used, the edifice of God, the house of God, and the spirit, the new Jerusalem. These are almost always subordinated to those, those, living, those living metaphors, those life metaphors. And the church is not seen as fundamentally a civic unit. It is rather, it's not, although it is talked about as the ideal city, it's really seen as something alive and in the believers. And so there's a, another great quote that I want to read. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is not only through the sacraments and church ministries that the Holy Spirit sanctifies and leads the people of God and enriches it with virtues, allotting his gifts to everyone according to his, as he wills. He distributes special graces among the faithful of every rank. By their gifts, he makes them fit and ready to undertake the various tasks or offices advantageous for the renewal and upbuilding of the church, according to the words of the apostle. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone for profit. These charismatic gifts, whether they be the most outstanding or the most simple and widely diffused, are to be received with thanksgiving and consolation, for they are exceedingly suitable and useful for the needs of the church. What I love about that passage is what, what, the, what the document is saying is everyone's gifts are to be received into the church. They are part of the church. It is a beginning, and in some ways I think, a, and maybe I'm reading this through Ignatian eyes, I think it's a, something of a breakdown of the sacred versus the profane. But it says the gifts of the Spirit are given to everyone to be used for the good of the church in its full life. It is really a call to us to see ourselves 
in what we are baptized into as priests, as prophets, as kings, as people who are meant to bless the church, bless the world, as people who are meant to uh, uh, tell the truth, which I think is the heart of being a prophet, and as people who are meant to care for the whole of creation, and which is really what it is to be a king or a queen in the classic sense. So that's kind of, I think, this is where Vatican, where Vatican II is, is built on. And this is, I think, where Francis is getting his, his heart. People ask, someone asked me recently, do you think Francis is going to call Vatican III? Is he going to call a new, a new council? And I think he's going to do something much more radical. I think he's actually going to implement Vatican II. <laughs> I think that's what he's doing. And if you hear this, you say, you know, even given the, the okay, it's non-inclusive language, there's still a lot of that sort of royal imagery, but even there, it is within this document, within the, the pastoral and the dogmatic constitutions, that you begin to see a new understanding of the, of the people of God and of the church. But there are challenges to this, and this is, I think, an important thing that we have to keep in mind. What is the world into which Francis find, leads us? And if we don't face this, if we suddenly start uh, as though it's a tabula rasa, we're going to get in a lot of trouble. Because there are certain things which, which stand out and which challenge us today, challenges the church. And the first, and I think the most important, the one to which Francis has spoken over and over again, especially when speaking with bishops, especially even in his uh, symbolism, is clericalism. Clericalism is the original sin of the church. What slavery is to the United States, clericalism is to the church. Slavery is that sin for which we can never quite get free, whose effects are always felt. Clericalism, I think, in the church is the same thing. Clericalism is the appropriation of power into the hands, not of ministers who are to administer things, but to a clerical caste, to a social group. It is where, uh, now you can look back to Constantine, you can blame Constantine for this, as some do, you can go back to farther to the Council of Jerusalem and you can say it's the people who are the, oh, it's those people who wanted circumcision versus Paul. They were doing the same kinds of things. You can go back to uh, the arguments among Jesus' disciples when they were trying to figure out who was the greatest. All of that is the same sin which manifests itself in the church as clericalism. Such clericalism is, I think, rooted in human sinfulness and in despair in that deep sense, on the part of those who hold power. One of the first things that happened when Francis was uh, elected, there was a, he was quoted as saying, and I don't know if he exactly said this, but he was quoted as saying something about the gay cabal within the Vatican. And people were like, oh my gosh, you know, he's anti-gay, why is he talking about this, da 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 And he clarified it, uh, that the issue was not that it was gay, the issue that was that it was cabal. He says that's the problem, is that there's this cabal that rules, this small group that rules within the Vatican, that thinks themselves, that the, the issue of being gay is really, they think themselves self-exempting. The very people who are, uh, seek to punish and to enforce the rules about homosexuality and the general populace are themselves living a, a duplicitous lifestyle because they somehow think that they are above it. This is a kind of despair in people who, in, in this level. And I, and I want to talk about that just a little bit to say, because I think this is the condition in which we're living. And it's a condition I think we in the United States are, are especially living. I think there is a strong um, bias in some ways. If the, the, the divisions in the United States are strongly rooted in this, in this split, I think some of the things that you've heard come out of um, Certain cardinals and bishops in the United States have shown exactly this division. And what it is is um, a, a, a belief that the model of leadership is based on the rank and power of those who are ordained. People feel disconnected and fearful in their own sinfulness and are at some level offended by the idea that the Holy Spirit can be gentle and constant. They seek to find a means, a power to control the gifts of the Spirit because they themselves cannot believe that God can be so good. 
in a weird way, this is a kind of despair that comes not because uh, they see God as so, the church is so dark, but because the church is so light. And the church is so light, they feel threatened by that. They don't know how to find themselves in it because they find their own darkness. And so they want to clamp down. In this model, leadership tries to capture some initial mo movement of the spirit so as to control it. It's like the, the story of the, you remember in the Transfiguration when uh, the disciples look up and they see Jesus and there's Moses and there's Elijah and Peter, who is always the goofball, always the response, let's build a tent and we can all stay here. <laughs> That's the mentality often is to, let's capture the moment. You know, somebody once said, you know, they quoted a, a they said, why didn't things change faster in Rome? And this cardinal said, we think in centuries. And the person replied, yeah, but the problem is it's the 14th century. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like that story, or, or the story of the circumcision in Acts, where there is, in the Council of Jerusalem, there is this feeling like, no, if we don't make them become Jews before they're Christians, then what will, we will lose our own culture. <clears throat> It's the story of, of Matteo Ricci, where people said, if we don't make them become Roman before they become Catholic, how will we ever know if they're really Catholic? <laughs> it's the fear that we're going to lose something that leads to a kind of, that is part of clericalism that leads to a legalism. It's clericalism that leads <coughs> to a magical view of the sacraments, where the priest is, is the power rests in the priest to change the bread and the wine. And it's not even in God. It's the priest in the, its most radical form. It's the priest's magic words. The priest says magic words and something happens. It's not the grace of God moving through the community that does this, but the priest alone. It leads to an influx of huge amount of money into the, uh, into the, the church because if this is the person who's your mediator to salvation, that's the person you're, so there's a certain temptation toward clericalism because it'll make you rich. Um, it is the idea that changes from the early church where we say no salvation outside the church to the idea that comes by the, I think it's the 14th, 15th century where it says no salvation outside the Catholic church, which is a significant little change there. Uh, it, sexism is connected to this kind of clericalism because sexism in the church Women being identified very much with the natural order, celibacy and clericalism being tied together because it is a way of controlling and a way of holding in and a way of spiritualizing what is otherwise a basically physical connection. And so you women who are seen as more connected to their, the physicality of the world are kept from the clerical <coughs> caste, excuse me, or required to somehow exclude themselves. So up to the time past Ignatius, up to the, you know, you're talking about the 16th century before women religious were allowed.